this is the last uh, fireside chat or, or sunrise chat of the year. But I first um, wanted to thank Leonard, a little gratitude, because he's uh, been doing these with me all year long. Um, and anytime you have Leonard by your side, it's, uh, it's a step in the right direction. Um, we always look younger. If you're small. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've uh, copied his fashion, you know, over the year. But in all seriousness, I was thinking about on, on the train ride in this morning what I've learned from Leonard. We, and it's funny because I've always, like, you know, observed from afar, and we've gotten to know each other in, in a little bit more of the last few years. Um, some big takeaways, you know. There's, and this is kind of something I think we shared. There's a, a practical component to what we do, right? I always say there's a legal component and there's also a, a practical component that we have to like get to, especially in today's market. Um, I love your idea of trying to uh, influence, you know, intelligent, smart, you know, powerful people through giving stories, examples. You know, that that's super, super powerful. And probably most important, which brings us here, you know, his passion for the industry and all of, all of us, right? Especially what's what's needed, um, and, and Leonard, I mean, to his credit, he's been talking about this for years. Everything that's happening now, he's been kind of warning us. You know, whoever, you know, talks about the hurricane three years, that's that was that's Leonard. So, but the good thing is we're here together, um, and he's, I mean, he's he talks the talk, walks the walk. Um, so without to, booties, <laughs> oh, <laughs> think, Lindsay might have something to say about that. No. Um, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But uh, no, but in all seriousness, thank you, because um, you, you've done a lot for me, you've done a lot for NIRAC and, and our industry, so I wanted to start off thanking you. Um, and, and of course, Lynn, we'll give Lindsay a chance to talk about the property, and then I guess you can, people can still look around after the uh, meeting. Okay. Awesome. Um, I want to introduce Gary, of course, and Flagstar. Morning, uh, everyone. Morning. Just by show hands, who is a, is a NIREC member and, and who, is, who is who's not a NIREC member? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> right. um, so I guess let's get into it. Yes. Um, talking about incentivizing buyers. And say, oh, I, I apologize. This is, this is going to make you happy. This is going to make you happy. So I have the stats that we have over the last three, four weeks, and I you know pay close attention. We track our stats. Are something worth noting? Um, so for a long time, for six months, 60% of our deals, give or take, were cash, right? 60. 60, six zero, which is not healthy. Like everybody, except Gary, loves cash deals, you know, quick, but it's, it's not, it, it doesn't make sense. It's not a healthy market, right? It's not a balanced market. The, right now, I mean, even this week, I, I had some intractables, and this week, actually, I had a lot of deals in two days, like a good amount of deals. Um, this week, it's about... 50% uh, cash, um, but the last two, three weeks before that, it's about 60, 65% financing, right? So that's a step in the right direction. It's a slow transition. Um, it's interesting also that the price points, since there's been more financing, our price points have come down dramatically. Our average price point was like about 2.2, now it's about 1.3, 1.4. So there's something happening, like slowly, and we're still seeing like little big deals here and there, but a lot of the lower level deals, more financing. You would say, oh, well, lower level deals, of course, is more financing. But when the market, you know, three, four, five, six months ago, there was cash deals at all price points. It didn't matter. So something, so just to give you a little excitement, a little, you know, ump as we enter the new year, I mean, we have to keep grinding, keep pushing. And I've been speaking to a lot of you at holiday parties and, a lot of you seem defeated. You know, a lot of you seem kind of discouraged. Um, but you, you can't. You gotta. You gotta switch that. You can't have that mentality, right? You got to. The end of the year, new year. We have to keep pushing, right? You have to keep showing up. Showing up to this is a win. Like, be be proud of yourself that you got here this morning. It's a little win, but you did something for yourself. You're gonna learn something, right? And you have to keep kind of taking steps forward um, because it's gonna turn. Things are gonna turn little by little, and there will be business. We all know that, and you have to. You know, be active, you have to be present and be ready for it. Um, so put a smile on your face and uh, let's I talk shop. Can I ask yes, that yes. before you jump in? Today is an important day. Um, and, and I think today is going to drive a lot of consumer confidence in going back to the market. Today is the day where the Fed's going to make a decision on what to do with rates again. 
people, and um, there's a 99.9% .9 chance that they're not they're going to remain unchanged. Um, that's an extremely positive sign for everyone. Um, we do a lot of analysis on where rates are going and you know when there'll be potentially rate cuts, which people started to talk about. But the speaking today, um, will we'll, every word is going to be hung on to, um, as they are in virtually every meeting. But today, I think they're going to indicate that. You've seen the Treasury, if you haven't looked, the 10-year Treasury is a good indication of where interest rates are going to go. And in the last month, um, since you know no, October to November, the Treasury went from 5.05 to 4.20, 4.20. So that's a meaningful move. Um, if you do you know the math on that, that's, that's actually almost a 20% reduction in the 10-year Treasury, which has helped with the easing. So that's the reason why they're not cutting rates right now. Um, that's a form of easing as well. So with that being said, assuming the Fed today does not move rates, which I, I can't imagine why they would, um, but I, assuming they don't move rates today, I think that's going to bring a lot of confidence to the market that rates will, are going to be coming down in 2024, um, probably as likely um, early as the late in the spring, um, and then moving throughout the course of the year. I mean, there's ex some people are predicting as much as a point to a point and a half reduction in rates next year. Wow. Um, now, I don't know if it's going to be that much. It all depends on what happens with um, inflation, with you know various other factors. Um, however, um, when you see, and that's probably the reason you're seeing more borrowing, is people are saying, okay, things are normalizing. Um, I, can, I feel confident going back in the market because I know I can refinance in a year mm -hmm. or two years um, and, and essentially you know, lock in something that's lower. We likely won't see the 3% again, um, no. probably for 30, 40 years again. <laughs> um, you know, I think that those days are gone. Um, but if you, we can get and settle in somewhere in the fives, we're in a good position. You know, the average you know, mortgage rate throughout history of being tracked is, is over 6%. So we're actually normal right now. It just doesn't feel normal because it's up 100% from where it was 24, year, 24 months ago, right? So just keep that in mind and, and say that to your buyers. This is a normal interest rate environment. And you know, the, if you take a short duration arm now, you are likely going to be able to refinance in the next 24 months at something dramatically lower that will easily cover the closing costs that you pay for the second transaction of refinancing. So just a, a, a thought, and the meeting today is at two o'clock. Um, if any of you are interested in looking, but I'm guessing you're going to see a nice market rally too for the stock market. So I think today is going to be overall a very good day. And starting, you know, with two wonderful speakers to my left, I mean, how could you go wrong, right? So um, if anyone has any questions on that, I'll be here and I'm happy to discuss it with you or, or anyone that you're interested in me discussing it with. So that's all I want to say. All right. I'm going to stand because the sun's sure. awful and I'm, I'm two inches short enough to have my shoes. <laughs> uh, so thanks so much for coming and supporting NIREC as I think NIREC hopes to support the brokerage community as much as possible. Thanks especially to Andrew and Gary for being extraordinary, extraordinarily supportive of NIREC, even through COVID and all kinds of uh, <coughs> moments where you could say, well, where's the real value of this to us? They have stuck by us and been instrumental in not only supporting us financially, but also in situations like this where the educational um, knowledge has been invaluable to all of us. So thank you so much to you guys. So I think today's thrust of the conversation, and I do want this to be conversational, not lecturing, because everyone's probably heard too much of my droning voice, but I think it's about a discussion on um, where going into 2024 we can potentially alleviate, alleviate some of the pain and anguish of 2023, although I would be the first to admit that I've been dejected and defeated feeling for the last 26 years. So I don't know of a simple, easy market, and maybe this is a different kind of difficult market, but I've never seen a market that was just so easy to navigate. I don't think anyone in this room would say navigating six um, competing bids is easy. So if we compare that extreme to maybe right now having no showings, they're both difficult to navigate. And I think um, this is one thing we all know about real estate is there's only one certainty about it, and that's change. So anytime someone's celebrating a great market, I always warn them, as Debbie Downer, 
that wait what comes next and vice versa. <laughs> so if we're in the Debbie Downer market right now, which is a little bit true, you know, it's a schizophrenic market, the next market that comes is different. Is it better or worse? I don't know, but it's going to be different. So that's the only certainty we really have. I do think the rates message is clear. You know, as rates come down, buyers on the sidelines re-enter. People feel more comfortable. And let's face it, part of the, the probably the biggest part of any real estate purchase, especially in the luxury sector, is some sense of confidence. And I think the last year and a half have been uh, years of, you know, on the fence levels of fear and anguish, and I think it's driven very much by the media. So today, one thing I want to do is uh, speak to the responsibility that I think all of us have in the community in our ability to message to the consumer the accuracy of what's really the role of a uh, real estate agent. And if you were to take a hundred, there are probably a thousand, a hundred of the articles that have been written in the last two months about real estate, you could literally rip them to shreds in the astounding levels of inaccuracy and mismessaging that we are seeing on a daily basis. It is a drumbeat of inaccuracy, mm. and it is actually intensely damaging because we see throughout the world how facts have all of a sudden become secondary. You know, <laughs> this wall is pink, right? And you say it a hundred times, and then all of a sudden say that that wall is pink because it's unbelievable how mismessaging repeated again and again and again becomes fact. So I would be unsurprised that if the um, case in Kansas that was filed, um, where one of the uh, participants of that case wrote an op-ed recently specifically comparing our industry to the travel industry. And in that op-ed he said, remember what happened to the travel industry and how getting rid of commissioned agents saved the consumer tons. Well, that is the message. That is probably the most effective message I could ever think of if I was speaking to the consumer. Savings. Whenever there's a sale sign at Bergdorf Goodman, people rush in, myself included. So if there's savings for the consumer, that is a very potent message. And I would bet that part of that message was what influenced a jury to say, this makes sense, this would save the consumer a lot of money. Look what happened to the travel industry. But who in this room even, who knows about commissions, knows that what happened in the travel industry merely took the commissions that would be paid to agents and transferred those commissions to another entity. We have one of those two and one or two of those entities in our business too. Online, do it yourself, right? There's no commission, but someone has to pay a price for operating those mechanisms, just the way someone has to pay a price for what we do. And we know how profitable it is, what we do, right? Not that profitable. It's certainly not that profitable for brokerages, which you are seeing consolidating by the dozen daily right now, because a lot of them are gonna be confronted with lawsuits that they cannot afford to fight, even if they're 100% right. And this consolidation is being forced upon the industry because we have done a lousy job in messaging to a broader consumer what exactly we do. I think we have been like, uh, I always compare us to, I think, the sausage makers. We don't want to take you into the factory. <laughs> Not pretty. Yeah. So we keep you in front of the house where you get a beautiful plate, napkin, and it's all beautifully presented. There's nice music playing in the background, the soft lighting. But back in the factory where they're making the sausage, things are not that pretty. And we know what it takes to navigate a no showings environment as well as an environment with multiple bids. And neither of those markets is easy, simple. Why? Because you're dealing with people's emotions. It's not just the technical aspects of what we do that matter in this industry. And they are vast. Just look at the paperwork that we Bless do. You. Bless you. In Manhattan, the paperwork that we do related to boards, both condo, co-op, and rental buildings is insane. That's an enormous volume that keeps growing, and one little box incorrectly checked or not addressed can spiral a whole wave of delays that can trigger all sorts of things that go bad. So the technical aspects of what we do are pretty easy to explain, but then we deal with a whole other wave, which as we all know are the emotional aspects, the educational aspects, 
and most importantly, the message that we have not addressed effectively is that the work we do often starts weeks, months, and years before the path towards a transaction even begins, and then it usually continues forever afterwards. And if you aren't doing that as a trusted real estate advisor today, you probably are going to be put out of business quickly. So I know the best agents in our world already are people who are consulting well before transaction, they facilitate transactions beautifully, and then they are advisors forever afterwards. If they were hedge fund managers, they would be paid a commission every year, right? If they were financial advisors, they would be paid a commission every year based on that. We only get paid at the time of transaction. It is a system that works. It kind of balances itself out. And over decades, it has proven to work very effectively. Are commissions fixed? I don't hear anyone saying, yes, they're fixed. <laughs> Why? Because we live commissions every day. Are commissions never negotiated? I have had not a single transaction in my entire career where I did not negotiate my commission. Did I get X, Y, Z? That's a different story. But there's always been a negotiation, another fallacy. So you have multiple fallacies here that provide us extraordinary opportunities to message fact. There's fiction and then there's fact. What are we broadcasting? The consumer, right? And if I look at Instagram, which has become the most vocal proponent of messaging today, that's instantly visible besides what we're telling people, which I cannot hear those conversations, the mailings, which I see a lot of them because I live in a kind of fancy building in a crappy apartment, but I get to see all the mailings that come to my building. The message we're sending, for the most part, has to change. It should include our successes. There's no question people want to work with successful people who are selling like properties. But just today I read a um, e-blast from someone, and we sold this in Conrad in five days. That's great. But the automatic assumption a consumer would believe is it took them five days, they got paid how much? That sounds too easy, they undersold the property. So whoever is messaging that message, think twice as to what that message is to the consumer. To you it might say, whoa, look how good I am. To the consumer, I promise you it says, you're overpaid, that was too easy, how dare you? So think about that message. Think about the message of you on a private jet, sipping champagne, <laughs> savoring the finest yoga <coughs> in the world, puffing a cigarette because you made millions of dollars selling real estate. What does the consumer think? Why are you earning so much? And why are you on my plane? That should be my plane. Worse than that, what about all the people who don't even have the capacity to think about flying on a private jet? Do you think they wanna know that the agent who's facilitating transactions, that seems like a quick and easy thing to do, is earning that much money? No. And the bottom line is, it's not like we're concealing fact. Yes, there are a few agents that earn a ton of money, the average agent doesn't, and a good majority of agents earn very little, and this year, a lot of agents earn very little to nothing. So that is the fact, and then you have the fiction. And who exactly is going to be impressed by that fiction? Because if the idea behind your messaging is to impress clients to work with you, think very, very clearly as to the question that every consumer asks with whatever message it is you are presenting to them, and that is, what's in it for me? If a consumer is answered by your marketing, what's in it for me? Chances are they will see value. So what are the messages you can send to the consumer that are of real value to their bottom line? And I would say, if I were to summarize some of the most important ones, it would be real-time data and information. We have access to real-time data and information. I can call Maris today and say, Maris, you just signed a contract on this here, it was asking $10 million, how close to that did you get? She will tell me, right? She may not give me the exact number because we're all a bit crazy about messaging her some of them, Maris is the craziest of all. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I can say that to Maris, we've known each other for a few years. Uh, but the message is, that is a kind of data and intelligence that's non googleable it's real-time data, and it's not averaged. We have to message to the consumer how invaluable and destructive and actually misleading averages are. 
That is something we haven't done because what does everyone do? I see it. These quarterly reports, weekly reports, annual reports, and the average price was this, and the average discount was this, the average days on markets was this. Year. Really? What is the height of the average person in this room? What is the average age of the person in this room? And do you think I give a you know what when I'm almost 60? I don't care. So the data that we provide the consumer has to be specific, curated, and pertinent to their specific need, not our need to throw out some cheesy headline, unless we want to become one of the crazy, you know, scandal for profit media entities that cannot survive unless they throw out some dreadful article with a, uh, a you know, a narrative that's really nasty, right? But what are we doing? Because we don't have control over all the media entities, but we do have extraordinary control in messaging <coughs> to our sphere of influence. Everyone in this room has at least 100 contacts, right? Chances are everyone in this room has at least 1,000 contacts between personal, business, colleagues, you take a thousand times one message and you multiply it by 15,000 agents just in New York City, and you have extraordinary messaging potential. If you multiply it by a million plus agents throughout the country, if they were messaging the message that was factual, <coughs> not fictitious, just imagine where we would be today. We would not even be having this discussion today. But unfortunately, familiarity is what drives the perception of and the familiarity that we have gifted to our world is reality television that has showcased on a day-to-day -day basis, repeated a thousand times if you get in the back of a cab, on a plane, and it shows some cheesy agent walking down a hallway with a calculator going, when I sell this apartment, I will make $100,000. <coughs> well, we know that that $100,000 is split with a brokerage, <laughs> then there are expenses, then there are all kinds of other things that you may, you may even have a buyer's agent involved or a listing agent. Who, who would have thunk? So that again, fictitious narratives repeated thousands, millions of times. And do you see the mountain that we are up against here? This is a mm -hmm. mountain, but every mountain has a path to its peak. Every mountain in the world. And I think every mountain on the planet has been you know, conquered. So we have this amazing opportunity. It is a choice. We can either choose to message or we can choose to whine. I choose to message. And I think whining and complaining, that's so unfair, you liar, you don't know what we're doing. Do you know how I suffer? I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> the consumer says, I don't care. The consumer's basically saying, you're overpaid. I shouldn't have to pay you, that's ridiculous. Because look at the travel industry. When the agents disappear from the travel <coughs> industry, I can get a flight business class from here to London round trip for 100 bucks, right? <coughs> no, I can't. In fact, I just recently did an analysis of uh, United Airlines ticket business class New York to LAX return. I did it on Kayak and I did it on United. The identical price. Nowhere could I find anything about disclosure of commissions. Really? Why was the price the exact same? Is that price fixing mm -hmm. in the travel industry when it was supposed to? So you get my point. We know what we do on a daily basis. And it is time for us to message clearly what we do on a daily basis. We don't need to message suffering. No one cares. But we can message very clearly what exactly we do. Because if you start getting into exactly what we do, it's kind of boring and long. But it's really <laughs> the fact of what we do, not the fiction. And I think it's time for fact, not fiction. So I encourage everyone in this room, please, I beg of you, spread the word. Stop spreading information about our profession that is a false narrative. <clears throat> it's a false narrative, and there is so much. For instance, having a connection to a Gary and an Andrew instantly, not just for their legal or banking services, but for their intelligence and data. I mean, calling Andrew today and saying, what percentage of people are financing today and getting that kind of insight. You will hear about what Andrew said probably six months from now. So will the consumer. The consumer is getting messaged via reports. Oftentimes they come in the mail several weeks after they were completed, which is of data that is closed mostly, that was transacted weeks and months prior to that. In that probably lies your greatest value to the consumer of all. Truly, by far, in my opinion, the greatest value of all. 
It's those non-Googleable insights and real-time data that really matter in decision-making. And in that lies a what's in it for me marketing opportunity. So message that one really, really clearly and repeatedly again and again and again. And you may want to also let them know what it takes to have the ability to collect that data. Number one, you have to be trained. Number two, you have to hone and practice the craft of being able to understand what to look for. You need to establish relationships over years to be able to call Ameris and have a not hang up, right? <laughs> because I've had some people call up and say like, and it's like, you can't speak to me like that, click. But when Ameris calls, it's like, hey, London, how are you? And there's a, that took years to establish, right? So what are the steps it takes to be able to be in the position to provide that real-time data and intelligence? That's a good message. But think of all the good messages that may not be in your direct best bragging interests, but may be more in the interests of real value delivered to the consumer that has a direct impact on their decision-making processes. Just to give you an idea, and we all do this, my clients sometimes don't transact for 10 and 15 years, yeah. but I speak to them on a regular basis. I don't call them because it's my personal style. I don't want to be their best friend, and they don't certainly want to be my best friend. <laughs> I mean, they're certain of that, and they're way too glam. But I'm in touch with them, and wherever there is an incidence of any kind related to real estate, not just transactional, anything related to real estate, they will call me, <coughs> or they'll email me. That is the thing you have to also message to your clients, that you are not there just for the transaction. I had clients just recently have some serious flooding issues in their basement. Within seconds, I had provided them trustworthy, pre-screened resources to help them navigate that. I followed up daily to check on what was happening. But what did it take to get those resources? Does everyone in this room have instant access to a resource list to help every single potential attribute related to real estate? There's someone in a, a stairwell, they cannot get a sofa up to their apartment. What do they do? Do you have the resource to chop that couch and take it upstairs? <laughs> if you don't, by the way, I'll share with one thing. I have luxuryconnect.com, which I've created over 26 years. It has a ton of resources. So if you haven't done it and you need to cheat, go there. And I'll tell you why I'm sharing that with you. And I do think it's a message also about sharing. When I share information with Maris, she shares information with me, and vice versa. So the, when Andrew and Gary share information with they can call me and I will share with them. It's a very reciprocal environment that is extremely collaborative. We do have a few players in our midst that are horrible, right? What have we done for them? We've celebrated them. We've given them ribbons and prizes. We've given them big articles. We invite them onto television shows to speak for our industry. So bad behaviors have been rewarded. Maybe we want to think about that. But in these reciprocal collaborative environments that we have created amongst ourselves lies an incredible opportunity to be instantly valuable to the consumer. And I remember growing up in South Africa, there was a great store called Pick and Pay. It's kind of the Walmart of South Africa. And the head of this company, it's a small world by the way, because the CFO of that company's kids are my clients in New York and Miami. And that's how small a world it is. But the owner of this company who built up a Walmart of Africa he said, everything I do is in the best interest of the consumer. Now, of course, it was really good for his bank book too, but everything he did truly was in the best interest of the consumer to the point where the consumer could actually believe it because they could see it. So anything I think we message to the consumer should relate to that. So I want to make this conversational and answer any questions you might have for me, and I certainly don't want to, I feel like I'm lecturing again is annoying and I've had too much coffee. But um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but big picture I would just ask of you, between now and January 1st, sit down and really maybe between small groups, friends, colleagues, a team, pull together all the messages you can relay on a daily, weekly, monthly basis to your sphere of influence that truly depicts not just what you do, not how you suffer, don't talk about suffering. No one wants to hear it. You know, when I wake up in the morning, I go like, uh, you know, Sophia Lauren said this year. I, she was, she was getting up there, and she said, I don't stick around friends who get up and go like, uh, can't do that. No one wants to hear about it. If you're in pain, shut up. <laughs> it's been a very difficult lesson for me. When I wake up, uh, shut up. But 
message to the consumer that which has real value to them. People are ex extraordinarily selfish. I bet no one in this room knows that, right? <laughs> Our clients are very selfish, even if they aren't selfish people. Real estate is a highly emotional entity. The transactional process is highly emotional. When something happens to your home, a flood, it drives you crazy, right? I have seen clients write apology notes to me afterwards, like, I don't know what happened to me. I became a monster. What happened? And I was like, I expected you to be a monster. And I said, you should be a monster, it's your home. And even people who buy buildings, I bumped into um, uh, Mr. Rudin last night at a um, event. He cares about his buildings. If you went up to one of his buildings and pulled out a plant in front of it, he'd get upset. Not because of the cost, he can afford millions of those plants, not thousands, millions of those plants, but it upsets him. He loves his real estate. Real estate, unlike a stock portfolio or crypto or even gold bars, is something you actually experience on a day-to-day -day basis, tangible. And in a world that is becoming less and less tangible, we have to understand how the value of it in the consumer's mindset keeps growing. It doesn't keep subsiding. We, do n we are incapable of living in virtual homes. Now, you remember a few months ago when people were trying to believe we could buy virtual real estate? You remember that. I'm gonna call out their names soon. Um, those people were selling fantasy. The reality is real estate and home is the most tangible real life experience that cannot go away. There's no technology that can replace a living environment, none. That's kind of a good thing, right? We're in business forever. Um, and I also think there's nothing that can replace human emotion, which means we're definitely in business forever because as we all know, I'd say 80% of what we do is navigating the emotional roller coasters on a day-to-day -day basis. So any questions for me? I just wanna have one quick point. <coughs> it also matters how you show up in the deals, right? How you present the apartments when the clients come. We always say, you know, I obviously spend time networking and marketing, but the best business or the best the best way, the easiest way, and the least expensive way to get business is by doing exceptional work, exceptional service. So Instagram certainly matters because that's projected to thousands of people, but you know, your connection with your clients and other brokers' clients, how you present yourself, knowing your product, you know, knowing the industry, being able to answer questions, being organized, being professional. And this is all coming from things I read, gripes about you, that each of you talk about each other, like not knowing the basics about an apartment you're showing. So how you present when the consumer's there, you know, is, is equally as important, right? It's, it, you are professionals, you are the doctor, you are the lawyer, you are the banker, you know, in our, in our world, in our city, it's the same level. So it, it's important that you know your craft and educate yourself so you're able to impress clients, give exceptional service, and the word spreads, right? Instead of saying, oh, this broker showed up half hour late, you know, they were like dressed in sweatpants and a t-shirt, unless you're in Tribeca, I guess that's okay. <laughs> um, and like they had no idea what was going on, they didn't have the keys. So, well, I think every touch point matters. Right. And now more so than ever because we're actually under close scrutiny. So every, every little touch point, even with those people you don't like or don't care about or are time wasters or are rude, right. This is the moment where our profession has to shine and go the extra mile to compensate for a lot of decades of damage. So the professionalism aspect on all levels, not just in the transaction, but every, every touch point of connectivity, whether it's, and I speak Instagram much over 100%, right, it's those actual direct connections that are probably even more important. Right, more powerful. How you speak on the phone, an email, the tone of a text, your spelling, the way you, Speak to someone just in a <coughs> setting where it has nothing to do with real estate, but someone recognize you, recognizes you, and you're representing a profession. Right. You're just not, you aren't representing yourself anymore. You are representing a profession. And if you want you and your profession to thrive, we all take on that responsibility. And unfortunately, if you don't, you will be commoditized. Right. And you will be marginalized. And, and that has happened in our industry often. You know, and that's why we're so responsive, and that's why we do so many things to make sure that our, our clientele, which is, is you in many cases, knows that we're available to you and we'll make ourselves available to you and show you the work that we're doing and know where the market's going and know the data that we shared with you earlier. You know, all those things is gonna be so much more important going forward um, because New York is so different than the rest of the country. And they're, they're commoditizing the entire industry using you know, I was saying to someone earlier, you know, someone in Iowa 
a buyer in Iowa is very different than a buyer in New York City. And the amount of work you need to do in Iowa is significantly different than the amount of work you need to do in New York City to get your, your buyer the best deal. So don't allow them to commoditize you. Let them know the work that you put in, not in a way of whining or, or crying, but in a way of, listen, I've, I've researched the entire neighborhood. You know, Make sure you're saying all the things that you may take for granted, but the buyer doesn't know. Because the, the amount of, you know, it's a, it's a very glamorous profession when you're in an apartment like this, uh -huh. right? <laughs> no, to, to, to the outside world. To the outside world, showing an apartment like this is very glamorous. People love that, people are jealous of us, by the way. They're yeah. jealous that we are in an apartment like this. Most people, 99% yeah. of people would be jealous that we're sitting here right now. They don't know what it's like when you sit at your desk sweating, <laughs> blasting through, getting hammered with phone calls from the same person and holding back what you want to say so bad, you know, but it, it as, as Leonard alluded to, it is a very emotional purchase. It's likely the biggest purchase that they're ever going to make, if not for the next one, right? So you have to deal with so much. Let them know the work that you do and let them know when you're, when you're engaging them what you intend on doing. I'm going to you know, canvas the entire market. I'm going to use the systems I have. I'm going to use the context I have to find out if there's anything off market for you, you know, and, and kind of walk them through it. In my opinion, that will go a long way because they don't know what you do behind the scenes. Even if they're Harvard educated, Goldman Sachs, they, they don't know. You know, the one thing I have found with even my highest end clients where they see value in me because a lot of them, a lot of them will send me something and say, what about that? One thing that really resonates with them is that I will tell them what is good quality, what is mediocre quality, and what they have to stay clear of. That's number one. So that's a huge value add when you have a true understanding of quality. And then number two is seeking out potential in things that others cannot see. That has been, I come from a design background. That has been enormously beneficial to me because whereas I never instruct people what they should do, I will tell them the things that I think are real estate value adds in an environment that would have great meaning to them. I also think one message that I wanna make very clearly today, which is probably the most important message, is I always feel that a lot of the messaging in real estate brokerage land is about winning. I don't like that concept because winning usually is about we beat them at the price fight. And Yes, a negotiation is an important aspect to what we do, and intelligent negotiation is very important. But ultimately, I have often told clients that what you pay for an apartment, ultimately, is less important than getting the right one. And you may end up paying more than you would have liked to, and it's maybe possible that you spend more than you should have or could have. Who cares when everyone else didn't see the potential or the kind of fitting and didn't get it? How many apartments exist exactly like this today? I'll tell you how many. None, not one. So if this apartment, after a long search, meets your needs, and you have to redo a kitchen, get over it fast. <laughs> and maybe in your negotiation, in your bidding war, it's not a war. Maybe it is an agent, a buyer's agent, and a seller's agent trying to come to a meeting of minds on behalf of their clients who are instructing them. You know how often there's a message out there that, well, my buyer's agent didn't get the price they could have. Yes, but ultimately that agent is a representation of the desires of their customer or client, right? We instruct them, we provide them options, and I think that's more importantly, that's maybe more important than giving them specific guidance. You know, when I say to people, you must do this, I, I've stopped doing that. Usually I've been right about it, but there's nothing worse than being dead right and dead. <laughs> so my feeling is give them two or three options. You can bid up to $10 million and get the apartment for certain and sign a contract within two, you know, two days. You're really, really rushing to get it. The alternative is let's bid at 9.5 and see what happens. Someone else may step in, but we're willing to take that risk. It's not my risk, it's your risk, your choice. But you understand how you're helping the consumer, providing them options. And I think that ultimately is what we should be doing in all our advice. Give them the option that you like most, as well as their alternatives. And it's about them helping them make wise decisions. 
But I've always said, you know, when I talked about the um, resources, time is all on this planet's last luxury. Time is the last luxury. <coughs> we can come up with, a, there's this new top vision from um, Austria now that folds out of the ground and unfolds and it's like 103 inches and it's $200,000. That's nice, but time is the real luxury because that's the only commodity we have little to no control over and we're all running out of it. Everyone, it's the only thing we have in common left on the planet. We're all running out of time and the other thing we all have in common, eight billion of us, is we all need a place to go to sleep to at night. That's great for real estate. That's great for the real estate profession. But by providing our clients with sensible options that message clearly, fact, that do not speak to our personal needs or agendas, but to theirs, is certain to resonate. The key now, I would say, is between now and January 1st, aside from your Instagram messaging or newsletter messaging, is to come up with systems to help you do this. Do you have the systems in place to make that easy? Do you have a very structured buyer's questionnaire so that when you meet with a new buyer, you sit down with them first, which is what I always do. I spend at least an hour with the buyer before we get going. I ask them a ton of questions, not just to get the answers, but to help them ask themselves the right questions that they haven't even considered. By the time I'm done with the questionnaire, guess what they usually say? Okay, now I see the value of working with the buyer's agent. Because you've really helped them navigate a very stressful, confusing moment in their lives. When I buy real estate, I work with an agent. When I sell real estate, I work with an agent. Why? Because I'm an emotional basket case and it's usually wiser to work with an agent who can really help you. But come up with the systems, have the technology in place to help you, have the time to spend with the clients. It's so important to have that immediate, instant access information that saves them time. Critically important. Deathly silence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, should we pause? <laughs> <the Phoenix around? laughs> Any quick question before we uh, give Lindsay the floor to? That was not related. Sure. Do you have any sense of how many deals are from generational wealth rather than earned? No, I don't really. Generally well, I'm going to tell you the biggest thing to be noted, and this is if anyone thinks that real estate is going to get much cheaper over the next ten years. The one certainty we have, and I think always when we look at precedent, you get the answer for a lot of questions, right? If we were to look at precedent over the last three years, $7 trillion worth of stimulus caused our economy and housing market an insanity, right? We'll all agree what happened in the last three years was insanity. Emotionally, politically, real estate-wise, finance-wise, economic, insanity, $7 trillion. Over the next 20 plus years, you're gonna have 10 times that figure. Mm. $70 trillion is going to be passed from one generation to next generations. That's called economic stimulus in disguise. Mm. So if you thought the last three years were crazy, buckle up. <laughs> you know, a point I'll make to that too is, is I, you know, as a banker, obviously I see where people put money. I've never seen so much money sitting on the sidelines. And when I get on the sidelines, not in the stock market. And it's not because the stock market hasn't done well, by the way. Dow hit, you know, one of the six all-time highs yesterday. So it's not because the market's not doing well. It's because they're waiting to do something with it. And my gut is, is they were waiting for rates to come down to do real estate. Um, and I see a, a tremendous amount of money sitting in treasuries, a tremendous amount of money sitting in cash money market funds, things of that nature. So you know, there's one of two things that's going to happen. Um, either they're going to plow back into the marketplace, in my opinion, in 24. I think the second half of 24 is gonna be insane because I think we're gonna see several cuts um, at that point, and then that's going to drive people into the marketplace, whether they're buying for investment or they're buying for their own homes. Um, but that money is not going, it, it's not just sitting there for no reason. It's, it, it would be in the stock market. It would be in something else other than treasuries and cash funds. But remember that money sitting in those markets, because I see I have some money and I have some cash set aside right now, earning 5%. Right. That's kind of nice. It feels kind of comforting. It's safe. 
but 5% ain't that great in a 4% inflation environment, right? <laughs> um, and sooner or later you wake up to it. Uh, and that 5% is now 4.2. Yeah. Right? So, so what's, what's happening now is, is you had the yield curve has been you know, really inverted, which for those of you who may not know, inverted yield curve means shorter duration rates are higher than long duration rates, which is not supposed to happen. So like a two-year treasury has a higher yield than a 10-year treasury. So <clears throat> that's starting to normalize now and go back to where it should be, and, and that spread is shrinking. So when that happens, people don't have access to easy returns like you're talking about. Cash is like renting. You only realize how much money you're wasting a few years later. <laughs> yeah. so, so if inflation stays where it's at, it's gonna eventually come to the point where keeping that money sitting in treasuries and money market funds is actually losing you money because inflation is exceeding the yield that you're returning and what you have what they call negative arbitrage. So I think you know we're going through a really interesting time. Today is again gonna be a very important meeting, but I think we're gonna see a lot of money flowing back into real estate in, in 2024. And I'm not just saying that because I want you all to smile at me, um, but I think it's, it's truly going to happen. Uh, I just see too much cash sitting in non-typical instruments um, although there is a good yield on it and it feels safe, people will feel safe again too when rates come down. The other thing I would note is, and I think the world is beginning to wake up to this little factoid, the crazy housing price surge that happened in the last three years did not happen in New York City. It happened a little bit in Brooklyn. Manhattan didn't have that crazy surge. It went up a bit in areas and some places came down. But that means that the escalation of the value of real estate in New York City right now has actually lagged inflation. And if you don't believe me, go look at replacement cost. You go look at replacement cost today and maybe you get a great site for five, six hundred dollars a square foot. And then you add on what it costs to build it, the legal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you might have a hair raising moment. One last thing before we cut out, I would say, if our industry has made a big, 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 error in the past is our obsession with price per square foot, because as we all know, all real estate and all square footage isn't created equal. The reality of it is, in New York City especially, most of our consumers are extreme luxury. And even if they're buying a $1 million one bedroom apartment, go tell that to someone in Kansas City. And I'll slap you. It's a luxury. That's for a, anyone that's to- a building in Kansas City. You know, kidding, but with rental income. So just remember that we are dealing with this luxury product, luxury consumer, and the luxury consumer needs to be reminded about one thing. Number one, reminded that they're pretty successful already. Just being in New York City and making it in itself is, you in this room are all achievers just by sitting here comfortably. You're fed and dressed, that in itself is an achievement on world standards. <laughs> Real achievement, it's New York City. But then the other one I think we should obsess more about than price per square foot is enjoyment per square foot. You cannot take it with you. Just look at Charlie Munger, who left $2 billion behind. Look at the heir of the Hermes estate now. I'm so jealous of this. <laughs> One of the heirs of Hermes, with $12 billion, has no heirs. So he is adopting his garden. I've always wanted to be a gardener. <laughs> Imagine, but think about that. Enjoyment per square foot reminds us again that time is the last luxury. We're all running out of it. You have to live somewhere. You spend a third of your life at home, close to a third of your life at home, if not more. You spend 80 to 90% of your life indoors. Do you get the picture? These are the kind of messages people need to be reminded of more so than that huge commission check that brought you a shed jet right down to Miami. <laughs> Because it ain't that good if you gotta share it, by the way. And if you don't own it. Uh, you know, yeah. Well, I always say the best friends to have are the people who do own this and share it. Yeah. Especially just, the young. Just don't do Instagram when you're on someone else's because they might think it's yours. All messages is look at my clients, how wealthy they are and successful, but don't say look at my yacht. <laughs> um, so, um, anything else? Uh, Lindsay, you want to speak about this beautiful sure. apartment? Yeah, well, thank you again for coming. <laughs> So this uh, apartment, as you can tell, is, is pretty special. It's, it's over 6,800 interior square feet, and then there's over 2,000 square feet outdoor. 
six bedrooms, six and a half bathrooms. Um, it's a duplex plus a roof terrace. And then you have a terrace, which I'm sure most of you have seen, um, right off of your entertaining space, which is very hard to find in a penthouse. That's one of the reasons why my client had bought it. Um, and the, the layout, so he didn't do the combination, but it was obviously a combination of, of units. And I think, I mean, certainly on the Upper West Side, if you look at penthouse products, this layout is, is pretty exceptional. So you have really nice separation of um, bedrooms downstairs. You have four bedrooms plus the primary. And then upstairs, you have a den here, obviously your entertaining space with two fireplaces. And then you have a really large guest suite um, and a small bedroom, which is great for an office as well. So if you have guests, it's good separation. Um, and the owner, so I have it off market. It is listed at $17,995. Um, the owner bought it for eighteen six in 2017 and did some work. And uh, you know, he's very reasonable on pricing, but he prefers to do an off market sale. So if you have anyone, please let me know. Very easy to show, it's a second home for him. Um, obviously, I mean, you coming here and being in New York City real estate, you know the location, but you do get a very nice view of Lincoln Center um, to the south, so you should take a look at that in the dining room if you haven't seen. Um, and please stay as long as you like. I'm happy to answer any questions and give tours. What is the monthly? 17.5 mm -hmm. total, which, you know, on a price per square foot mm -hmm. basis is about 250, mm -hmm. um, which Cheap. as we know, compared to new it's development. Cheap. It's almost yeah. half of new buildings. It really yeah. is. Um, and you have wonderful staff here, resident manager, all the all the guys. You know, he even has somebody that comes regularly since this is a editor and he's an engineer and he checks everything. So you know, it's a very high quality building. Thanks for hosting us. Thank you. Yes. Yes.